thanks for having me. Great to see everyone. Um, my name is Alan Day. I'm a, a member of the Workstation Working Group. I was chairing the group for the F36 cycle as my first cycle as chair. So it's kind of nice to be here presenting the, the release. Um, when I'm not doing um, working group stuff, I'm doing design work on the desktop, I work as part of the desktop team and also uh, upstream in the GNOME project. And today I'm just gonna be talking about all the cool stuff that's in Fedora 36 workstation. So um, I'm hoping that there's people here who've already tried it. Um, I've been using it for a while and it's, yeah, it's a really strong release we've had um, great reviews, great responses so far. And I know personally, I'm really enjoying it. There's a lot of really like, awesome improvements in there. And really, there's just too much to talk about in half an hour. So I'm just picked kind of a small number of personal highlights that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail there, talk a bit about the features, what's involved, and um, you know how you can make the most of it. And um, when you're using uh, Fedora Workstation. Um, so a lot of the features I'm going to be talking about uh, are part of the GNOME 42 release. That's the most uh, recent GNOME release. But, you know, I consider them to be Fedora features as well. You know, we a lot of these features have had members of the Fedora community participating upstream to make this happen. And they've all had to be tested and integrated and made to be part of the experience uh, that is Fedora 36. So while a lot of the, the material, the features are part of GNOME, I, this is, you know, th these are also Fedora, Fedora features in my opinion. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So uh, dark style, we have, uh, we have dark mode now. Um, you know, other platforms have it. We know it's a popular feature. People often ask for it. And um, it took us a little while to get there, but we have it now. And, um, you know, the main thing is that it's been done really well. It's been implemented uh, in a very robust way. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the different aspects of this seemingly simple feature. Um, Hopefully this will work. I'm just going to show a quick screencast just to show it in action, just in case no one has seen this so far. So this is something I recorded, what was the 12th? So was that yesterday? No, two days ago. Um, so we can hear the settings, see the settings window here on the left and switching between light and dark. And in the same panel, you can also change the wallpaper. So you can see as, the wall, as we switch wallpapers, you get a dark or a light version. And um, those are available for both modes. So you get these nice transitions as you go back and forth between dark and light, and between the two modes. And it's really nice and smooth, and everything looks great. And you know, this was a lot of the work um, that went into this was going into those kind of details. Um, you know, there's been a lot of architectural work over the past um, year or so, um, all of which enables much more flexibility in how we render the UI and makes these kind of transformations both possible and makes them more robust. You know, um, what you don't want is to switch into dark mode and lose some buttons or something because um, they haven't been styled to, to fit into, into the, dark, the dark backgrounds and so on. Um, the way this has been implemented, everything kind of just works. It works really well. And certainly when I've been testing this in Fedora 36, I haven't encountered any styling problems at all going between dark and light. Um, so they did a really great job there. Um, the other kind of details here that are worth mentioning, this has been implemented as a cross desktop uh, standard for the setting. Uh, so that's really great. That means that um, for third parties wanting to target the Linux desktop, there's one setting they need to look at and one setting only. That's really great for adoption. Uh, the other really great thing about this uh, is uh, the background integration, which I've already mentioned, but um, 
that's a really nice aspect of the feature. And you know, the Fedora design team was involved uh, in making sure that the the Fedora backgrounds are all compatible with dark mode. And that's something we're looking at for the next cycle to, to hopefully uh, increase the number of wallpapers that we have that work with dark. So that's really great. Um, so yeah, dark mode, great feature to have. Um, we've already got plans to improve and extend it for next release for Fedora 37. Uh, scheduling is one thing that's being talked about. Uh, so having the ability to, to um, have dark mode automatically turn on and off um, depending on the time of day, that's something that we'd like to see. Uh, the other thing that we'd really like to have is a quick toggle. Uh, right now, you have to go into the settings to to, to switch this either way, and um, you know that's obviously not not particularly uh, convenient. So for the next cycle, we'd like a button that you can get to from the settings menu uh, in the top bar, just to enable you to quickly switch between between the modes. So uh, look out for that. Hopefully, we'll get it for next release. Uh, you know, as always with these things. No promises. OK, let's move on. Uh, so we've got a new screenshot UI for, for F36. Um, this is something uh, that we've wanted for a while. And you know, as part of my day job, I take a lot of screenshots. So uh, this is something that uh, I've been using very heavily this week. and been really enjoying using. It's taking screenshots is so much easier now uh, and such a more pleasant experience compared to how it was. Um, so it's really exciting for me personally to have this in. Um, so just to refresh our memories before we get into the new experience, obviously you know, the old way uh, to take screenshots was primarily through uh, shortcuts. We have different keyboard shortcuts for uh, taking an area of the screen or copying to clipboard or screenshotting a window, I think. Um, and that was the main way that people did screenshots. Um, the way it works with the, the, new, um, the new UI, you just need one key, and that's the print screen key. And you just press it once. And the capture is taken, and then you're dropped into this um, this UI. And I've got a screencast of this in action now, just to show it show it in use in case no one's seen it. So let's just go into that now. And hopefully this is coming through okay. And you know it's hard to know with the quality. But you press print screen, and we're in this UI, and you've got uh, this UI here for selecting an area of the screen. If you want to select an area, you can select an entire display. Or you can select an individual window. And when you switch into this mode, you get this choose a UI to pick the window you want. And the other thing that we have here is screen recording. So you can flip into that mode. And this is your recording UI. And here you can, you can do an area. If you just want to record an area, or you can do the full screen. And in both modes, we have this uh, toggle for the one to show the, the pointer. So that's it. Um, it. It looks fairly simple, but there's quite a lot there once you once you start getting into it. Um, so the neat thing about the way this thing works is that when you press that print screen button. All the captures are immediately taken. So um, it takes an a, a image of the, the full display and of each window. And when you're dropped into that, um, that UI, that is essentially an, an editing UI. That's, um, you're editing the captures that have already been taken at that point. And that's really cool. It's, the main reason I find it to be really cool is that Taking the capture is instantaneous. So often when you're taking a screenshot, it's of something that's uh, transient, that's there that second, and you want to capture it straight away. And um, 
you know, if at that moment you've got to pause and think about which area you want to, to capture or which keyboard shortcut to use, um, that's not what you want to be doing at that moment. You just want to capture the thing and then worry about what to do with it afterwards. And that's what this UI allows. Um, so that's something I find uh, really handy about this. Uh, the other really nice thing about, about it is it allows you to be a bit more relaxed in the way you, you use the thing. Um, the old the old approach with the, the, the shortcuts is a bit like a kind of trial and error kind of approach. You know, you would um, it maybe like capture an area and draw the rectangle and then maybe it won't be quite right. So you go back and you do it again and you keep going through this process until you've got exactly what you wanted. Um, with this new approach, you just press the button and then and then everything you've got the time to to get it just how you'd like. And you know, since I've been using this, I don't think I'm about to go back and try and take a screenshot again. It's always been, you know, a case of editing it afterwards and then getting it just right. And then it's and then it's done. So it's um it's just more relaxed, it's less stressful, um, there are fewer errors involved. And then the other um, really cool thing about this is obviously the, the screen recording, which we didn't really expose before, and we didn't have area screen recording in the past, um, which is just super useful. And you know, in the past, I would personally I'd use like a, a third party app for this, but that has never felt very convenient, and you know, you might have reliability issues. Sometimes um, those apps wouldn't work very well. So now we have this and it's all right there, available from one key, built into the system, and you can just use it when you want. So that's that's fantastic. So yeah, uh, the new screenshot UI, I think that's a major highlight in, in F36. I'd encourage everyone to to try it out, to try the different modes and uh, the, the different ways that you can capture images with that. Uh, it's really great. Um, we do have a few uh, plans to improve the, the shortcuts there. I know some people are looking for more shortcuts um, to be able to, to use it like the old, the old uh, screenshots. So we do have some kind of legacy uh, support there if you do just want to quickly use a, a shortcut instead and i think we're going to be reviewing that and maybe adding to those um so that's some but i think that'll be something for f37 all right um so the the, the final major thing i'm going to talk about here is gtk4 and um, um i'm going to talk about a few different aspects of gtk4 because um, I, th I don't think a lot of people realize how big a deal it is and uh, what it's going to mean for the, the desktop platform going forward. So I just wanted to talk a few different aspects of, of GTK4 here. And, you know, obviously GTK4 has been around for a while. It was, it was actually released back in December 2020. Um, but the reason that uh, Fedora 36 is is exciting from this perspective is that this is the first time we've seen uh, applications migrating to GTK4 on mass. So for Fedora 36, we have a whole bunch of the, the core apps, the pre-installed apps that are, are using GTK4 now. Um, so that's, that's, that's quite significant. So um, I'll just show you a few screenshots of these. So we have uh, the software app that's in GTK4 now in the GTK4 version. It's the one at the top um, in the foreground and the old, the older GTK3 version that's in the background. And the main thing to note here is, you know, there's some, the styling is slightly different, you know, um, the, the GTK4 version, it's a bit, it's a bit lighter and flatter. Um, the, the settings app is another app that is using GTK4 by default in Fedora 36. Um, 
Again, styling differences, um, you, know, you can see with the lists are, are somewhat different here. It's worth noting that uh, the, the GTK4 port of the settings app was just a massive, massive undertaking. Um, it's just a huge amount of work. And not only was the, the, the application ported to GTK4, but a huge amount of the, the UI was refreshed and updated at the same time. So um, just looking at my notes, like the, the list of panels that had design updates is the application settings, the appearance settings, which was previously background, the display settings, uh, regional language, and, and the user settings. So uh, five of the settings panels were revamped to varying degrees. So major piece of work there, also in Fedora 36. Um, final example of a GTK4 versus GTK3 app. It's just the calendar, uh, the calculator, sorry. Um, so you know you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, you know these these apps look a little bit different, um, but you know the GTK4 and the porting to GTK4 is is much more than that. So you know GTK4 was it's about four years of development time, and it came slightly under a decade after the previous major GTK release, which was GTK3, which was in. February 2011. So this is, you know, in terms of you know, historical terms, this is very significant release. And there's some very significant changes uh, under the hood, which um, I think are significant for users and also for developers. And I'm going to talk about uh, three of those. Uh, number one, GPU rendering. Uh, so GTK4 apps, do the, a lot of the graphics rendering on the GPU. Previously, this wasn't the case with GTK3, uh, the rendering was done um, on the CPU. And so the obvious impact of this, everything gets faster, smoother, more efficient. And you'll notice this when you're using these GTK4 apps, it's fast, it's like it's really fast. Uh, particularly things like scrolling, animations and so on. So this is just really, really cool, and uh, it's really exciting, and you know, um, something that people will hopefully be appreciating when they're using these GTK4 apps. And personally, I'm really excited about um, you know the the next wave of these the porting effort, like getting the vast majority of the desktop using GTK4. I think will be a very significant upgrade to, to the experience in terms of just the, the rendering speed and the smoothness of rendering. So this is pretty exciting and pretty cool for the, for the platform and the, and the product as a whole. Um, second thing, uh, similarly on uh, speed and efficiency, uh, GTK4 has uh, these new capabilities for uh, presenting lists and grids. Um, these are new widgets which are uh, replacing the old GTK tree view, which have been around since the GTK two days. And um, these, there's a couple of things about these. You know, the first, these are uh, modern GTK widgets, so you can style them how you want. You can embed um, other widgets and elements in them like you want. So there's a lot of flexibility there, and you can make it look really nice. But the other thing is that these are super, super efficient. Um, like this is a screenshot of GTK4 demo. And you can see this grid has over 16 million cells in it. And you can just interact with it like normal. You, know, like you, don't, you don't notice. And the reason GTK can do this is that it's only creating widgets for what's actually being displayed on screen. So there's uh, a data model which contains um, a record of all the items, and then GTK will work out what to actually build in terms of UI and put on the screen, and, and that enables it to be very, very efficient. Um, so this isn't being used in many places at the moment. There's a few places 
Um, but the big thing about this is this is what's going to be used in uh, the file browser in Nautilus when it puts GTK4. So um, we'll get you know pretty lists and grids that will be super super fast. And you know this is a, an important capability. Uh, it is something that's going to enable us to see some pretty cool developments in future releases. Okay, um, third and final thing about uh, GTK, and uh, also from the talk, I think, um, you know, GTK4 is very much kind of batteries included. Uh, it has this companion library called Liberator, which kind of comes, brings with it like everything that an application developer might need to create um, really awesome apps really easily uh, following the, the the, the GNOME design patterns and the, the, the design guidelines. Um, so if you're writing an app in GTK3, uh, you might be, you know, doing a lot of layout work yourself, uh, you know, uh, nesting all your boxes and putting widgets in them. And you might be having to do some custom widgets and custom styling to get things to look just the way you want. So with GTK4, like, a lot of that just goes away, right? Like everything is there out of the box with quite high level components that you can reuse very easily. So you wanna do a preferences window. Well, there's a class for that and it almost becomes just an exercise in declaring which preferences you wanna expose and all the layouts and the widgets and everything is it's just done for you. So the applications that have been ported to GTK4, which are now included in Fedora 36, just a huge amount of code has had it's just been deleted. It just isn't needed. All that, all that custom code is just gone now. Um, the other thing that we've got is we've got a lot of new widgets for the coming in for the first time, like you know, modern design conventions, like we've got the toasts and different style buttons and um progress indicators and so on. Um so as a user, what you will see is you'll see much more polished applications because there's less custom code, so that is greater quality. And you'll also see more modern design conventions. So just the apps are better, is <laughs> essentially what I'm saying here. And the other thing is, you know, it makes it easier to make the apps. So we're already seeing this having a big impact on the, the ecosystem. Lots more desktop applications coming through. Uh, lots more of a community around these applications and, you know, go out and browse uh, Flathub or, um, you know, browse Gnome Circle, for example, and just see the apps that are available there. It's really exciting time. Uh, there's never been a better time to be um, creating desktop apps for Linux, I don't think. Uh, Alan, we're at three minutes left here and a few yes. questions. You want to want to take a few of them? <laughs> yeah, why not? I'm going to end on this slide and I will just leave this here so if you want to read the list of all the things that i would have liked to have talked about but <laughs> couldn't you can uh, there's a lot there's a lot there in the release which it's a really strong release so it's, it looks it's like exciting. a nice long list there yeah all right cool. uh, so th the first question here actually is uh, is there going to be a contest for supplemental wallpapers again in the future um and I think there was talk about that on the Fedora design list too, is where that has been traditionally run. So if you're interested in that, I think Fedora design list is the place to go. Alan, do you know any, any more about that? Yeah, I mean, Mo, Mo had, a, had a call this week to talk about wallpaper planning. Um, there's definitely plans to refresh the supplemental wallpapers this cycle. And I think there's definitely interest in running the competition again. I think the main thing is um, there needs to be a volunteer to, to take that on. But I think everyone would love that to happen and we'll facilitate that. We're just looking for a volunteer at the moment. It could be the person who asked this question. It could. Uh, that's, that's how you get voluntold to do things. Um, so they've got a couple of screenshot questions here. Uh, the first one is mm -hmm. how to change the storage location. Good question. I don't know, but I can find that out. <laughs> All right. Well, the second one is: um, is there a lightweight editor to draw arrows, boxes around things? Um, they're using uh, Pinta instead of the built-in thing because of that. Is there other plans for that? 
Um, there, there are designs. We would really like to have those capabilities built into the image viewer. And there is a, 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 a new image viewer being worked on upstream. It's still very early days. But um, yeah, I, I agree. It would be great to have those capabilities out of the box. And we do have design work for that. So and then some, someone also asks if video recording for Windows rather than just area is planned or that works. Yeah, I, I don't know how you would do that. Um, I, I suspect there are some technical limitations there, but I, I, I don't know for certain. Uh, and then someone asks the main differences between the console and the new and terminal. I forget which one is new now offhand. Console is new. What advantage does the new one bring? Uh, so it has some some neat features, um, fairly small things, but, but nice all the same. Like uh, it supports dark mode properly. It has the, the header bar changes depending on the privilege level or whether it's a remote connection. Oh, that's kind of cool. There's a slightly a nice uh, um, find UI in there, I think. So a little kind of UI polish, essentially. But I think the other thing about a console would be it, it would perhaps give us a bit more flexibility um, in the future to add more, uh, I suppose, kind of future facing kind of features. You know, we're very interested in you know, integration with Git and with containers and those kind of things, which I suspect wouldn't be such a good fit for the existing terminal. But I think that the, the new one might be a good space to to um, to explore those. I personally really liked a long time ago. Owen presented a great thing called Purple Egg, which goes nicely with Silver Blue, I think, uh, which is basically a console integrated uh, thing for managing containers, managing toolbox, basically. I think for silver, blue, and those kind of things, having toolbox integration into the console is going to be a huge thing. And I scared Alan away with that 